Welcome back to another Sabbath School lesson in this series, God's Mission, My Mission. We're on lesson number four and we're studying the life of Abraham. Now, Abraham had three major qualities that our lesson brings out. He was hospitable. He reached out in kindness, compassion to people around them, trying to meet their needs. Second, he had a love, a love for people that were different from him, a love for people whose values were different. We're gonna study about that. And thirdly, Abraham was a man of intercessory prayer. God's mission, my mission. When the mission of God for us is filled with hospitality and kindness, reaching out in love to people around us, and when we are interceding for them, God will give us results. But before we jump into our lesson, there are two passages in the Bible that talk specifically about Abraham and his relationship with God. One is found in Isaiah 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Now, God is talking about Abraham, and he says, Abraham is my friend. It's not only that God was Abraham's friend, but rather Abraham was God's friend. So when God looked out over this world, he said, there's my friend. What a wonderful thing to be called a friend of God. That also is mentioned again in the book of James, chapter 2. It's a wonderful expression about Abraham. God looks down in this world and he says, there's one of my friends. That's Abraham, my friend. What a joy for God to call you his friend, to be known as a friend of God, one who really um, is looked upon by God as that kind of friend. We find it again in James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So what's Abraham called? The friend of God. And we're going to study in this lesson why he was called the friend of God. Our memory text says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Abraham had love for God and he had love for people. That characteristic is the characteristic of one that is a true missionary, true soul winner for Christ. Soul winners love people. They love them because every human being was created in the image of God. And although they've fallen and sin has marred that image, God wants to restore his image in humanity. Abraham, a friend of God, who reaches out like Christ did, and loving compassion to others. Our lesson opens with Sunday's lesson called The Gift of Hospitality. We see Abraham sitting at the door of his tent, looking down a pathway. Now, it's a very hot day. Sun is beating down as it would in the Israeli-Palestinian sky. The sun is beating down. Why is Abraham there? Why is he looking down there? Maybe because he's waiting for somebody to come down that pathway that he can show kindness and hospitality to. He's pitched his tent by that thoroughfare. And as he looks out, he sees three men, what he believes are three men coming down. They're actually divine heavenly beings. And as Abraham looks at them, the Bible points out that it says in Genesis chapter 18, so if you have your Bible, turn over to Genesis chapter 18. This tells you something. There are three passages here that tell you about Abraham's hospitality. Genesis chapter 18. We're looking there at verse 2. He lifts up his eyes. He looks down that pathway and he says three men are standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, bowed himself in the ground, and he says, give me a little water. Let me give you a little water. Now, notice three times in this passage talks about Abraham making haste. He ran from the tent door to meet them, verse 2. 
verse 6. So Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it, make cakes. Notice verse 2, it says he ran. Verse 6, it says he hastened. And it says he quickly goes to Sarah and he says, make ready. And then verse 7, Abraham ran to the herd. In other words, Abraham did not have to be coerced, forced, or conjoled to be, hospita to be hospitable. Something within him longed to reach out in hospitality, to provide water in the desert of thirst for these three travelers, to provide some heated cakes that would be heated, uh, these wheat cakes on uh, the griddle, to provide a full meal for them, to get them to rest and lodge in his house. As we reach out in kindness, in love and hospitality, inviting people to our homes, letting them find in our homes that oasis in a world of anxiety, in a world of stress and tension. Every Sabbath is an oasis of refuge as we come to church. But as we leave the church, there are single moms that go home to abusive situations. There are, young ch there are children, teenagers, whose parents may not be Sabbath-keeping Adventists. There are the elderly, the widows, the elderly couple, to invite them to our homes, to make haste to help them, to have eyes like Abraham that are looking throughout the congregation, seeing who can I bless today. I love what it says in the lesson. If you look down at the fourth paragraph, it says, Abraham was aware of his mission, which was to share with everyone the knowledge of the Lord in a world engulfed in paganism, idolatry, and polytheism. Polytheism means they believe in many gods. As we can see in this instant, his most immediate way to fulfill his mission was through hospitality toward these strangers who seemed to have just appeared on the horizon. I had a secretary who every Thanksgiving, you know, in, in America we have Thanksgiving the fourth Thursday in November, and every Thanksgiving she would look over her neighbors and say, who doesn't have a place to come to eat today? One of the, my nieces, every Thanksgiving invites people who are down and out, people that may not have a home to go to, to her home to eat. My own daughter, when her husband was teaching at Southern Adventist University, often invited students to their home to eat on Thanksgiving and regularly as well on Sabbaths who didn't have any place. There's something that takes place when you have people around your table, when you can share your life with them, when in the quietness of your home, you can share the love and grace of Christ with them. We end up our lesson here on Sunday with a question. What principles of Abraham's example of hospitality can you emulate in your own life? What, I want you to think about that. What principles? Make haste to reach out to others, to invite them to your home, to share a meal. Reach out, make haste to bless others. Now, Abraham had a love not only for those who had the same values as him, but he had a love for others as well. In Genesis 18, verse 16 and onward, Abraham begins to intercede for Sodom. Sodom is facing destruction. The strangers tell him, these angelic beings, tell him that they're on their way to Sodom. Sodom was a godless city. It was a sex-centered, thrill-jaded, morally twisted, defiled city. People lived for one predominant reason, and that was pleasure. And these heavenly beings were on their way to bring judgments upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Certainly Abraham, as our lesson says, knew just how evil and wicked the people of Sodom were. But yet, he knew how much God loved that city. And the love of God was reflected in his heart. And so Sodom 
be ready to be destroyed becomes the object of Abraham's prayers. And in Genesis 18, verse 23 to 32, Abraham begins interceding for Sodom by reasoning with God. We might think of this section in Genesis 18, 16 to 32 as um, a intercessory prayer. So Abraham says to God in verse 24, suppose there were 50 righteous people within the city. Would you destroy it, the place, and not spare it for 50? Oh God, what if, what if there were um, 50 people there? And God says, well, I wouldn't destroy it if there were 50 people there that were righteous. So Abraham goes on. Well, God, would you destroy it for the city for a lack of five? What if there were 45 there, God? Well, God says, I wouldn't destroy it for 45 people. And Abraham keeps reasoning with him, keeps interceding with God. Now, this is not arrogance. This is rather a humble pleading with God to save that city. So he, particularly, he, he keeps going down in his numbers. And he says, what if there were 20 there? God says, I won't destroy it for the sake of 20. And Abraham says, okay, what if there were 10 there? And God says, I won't destroy it for 10. Verse 33, so, uh, this Genesis 18. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. What do we find in that in, in, interchange? We find this hospitable Abraham whose heart was filled with love for a lost, rebellious city, interceding or pleading with God to save the city. Are you pleading with God, interceding with God, to save that son or daughter that doesn't know Christ, to save that husband or wife that doesn't know Christ, to save that neighbor that doesn't know Christ? You know, John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, would get on his knees and he would pray, Oh God, give me Scotland or I die. Pleading with God for a city. God, give me this city. Abraham pled with God. Abraham sought God for Sodom. It reminds me of what our Lord said in James chapter 5, verse 16. You'll find this verse listed under Tuesday's lesson. James chapter 5 and verse 16. And we find it there in Tuesday's lesson where it says, the last part of the verse, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does it mean that it avails much? It means that it makes a difference. Our prayers make a dramatic difference. Now, God was doing everything he can, could to reach Sodom before Abraham prayed. But Abraham's prayer opened the door for God to do more in Sodom than he could have done had Abraham not prayed. But you said, wait a minute, Sodom was destroyed anyway. Yes, it was. But God moved upon hearts in Sodom as the result of Abraham's prayer to bring people to conviction, but they still had a choice. There were only four that left the city, and only three of them would ultimately be saved. When the angels approach Sodom, they find a lot at the gate of the city. Now, the gates of the city were the places where the influential political leaders of the city sat. The gate of the city was a place where discussions took place, a place where judgment took place. Abraham sat at the door of his tent. Lot sat at the door of the gate of the city. Abraham looked for visitors coming. Lot looked for visitors coming. Abraham invited them to his house. Lot invited them to his house. Now, you'll remember that as Lot invites them to his house, there's this terrible ruckus. These vile men want to defile these three men, but Lot protects them. Ultimately, Lot is hastened out of that city. His wife still has her heart in the city, and she looks back because her heart is still in Sodom. 
and she's turned to a pillar of salt. Now, Lot made a lot of mistakes in his life, some great mistakes in his life. His heart was right. He wanted to follow God, but he yielded to the insistent pleading of his wife and children to live in that city so they could experience more pleasure. What a dangerous thing it is today to enter into a city with our children and families and disregard God's specific counsel. Now, if the reason we're moving into a city is for mission, the reason we're moving into a city is to uh, bring health and healing and hope to that city, that's one thing. But if the reason we are moving into a city is because we feel it has more advantages and will bring more economic prosperity and bring greater pleasure to our family, we are really on dangerous ground. Lot was saved, but Lot lost a number of his family and relatives in that city. It says here in Wednesday's lesson, we don't know how many people, this third paragraph down, fourth paragraph down, we don't know how many people were living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah at the time of this account, but among these thousands of people, only four left the city and only three were saved. The same with Genesis flood. We don't know how many were alive then, but we know that most were not saved. This lesson is quite vital for those of us that do mission. We do mission because we're sent by God, chosen by God. But that does not mean that everybody we witness to is going to be saved. It doesn't mean that everybody we share Christ with is going to accept. We, our responsibility is to be faithful in sharing the gospel. But every individual has a choice. When you look at Abraham, the thing that I want you to take away from this week's lesson is Abraham's submission to God's will. We see that specifically in three areas of Abraham's life. When we go back to Genesis chapter 12, we find that God said to Abraham, get out of this country and uh, come to a place that I'll show you. First, Abraham's calling. Abraham's calling came directly from heaven. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Abraham was submitted to God. He sensed that God had chosen him for mission. He sensed that God had called him to leave his comfortable confines and his comfort zone and to step out for mission for Christ. Abraham submitted to God's will and responded to God's call. God is a call for your heart too. God is calling you to mission too. God is calling you to be a witness in your neighborhood too. First thing we notice about Abraham's submission is he submits to God's will. The second thing we notice about it is Abraham is given a choice. They're going to divide up the land. And Abraham can take any land he wants. But he sees that Lot wants the city towards Sodom. Abraham allows Lot to make that choice. Abraham chooses a more rural country pasture or life. Abraham is not going to allow division to tear him apart from a lot. He's gracious, he's hospitable, he's kind, he's unselfish, but he's totally submitted to God's will. The third thing we find about Abraham is this, that in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's submitted to God's will. He pleads for Sodom, he doesn't want the city destroyed, but he submits to the overall will of God. How do we apply this to our practical lives? How do we apply it to where we live today? God is calling you like he called Abraham. Submission to God's will means that I lay my life on the altar. I say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever direction you want to lead my life, I'm putting my life in your hands. It means God... I'm not going to battle with my brother over so, or sister over some competitive thing in the church or any other place. All I want to do is be faithful to you. I've been chosen for mission. I want to fulfill the calling that you've given for my life and let God deal with other lives to fulfill his calling for them. And Lord, 
I want to be like Abraham, hospitable, reaching out to others, seeing their need. I want to be like Abraham, filled with love for the lost. I want to be like Abraham, praying, interceding for the lost. Will you accept the challenge today to be like Abraham? We accept the challenge to look with eyes divinely enlightened for people in your neighborhood that may need a loving touch, that may need you to bring them a meal. There may be a widow whose husband has died. A hot meal would make such a difference, some hot soup and homemade bread. It may be a man who's just had surgery who needs his grass cut, and you may be able to go there to help him. Maybe, needs, maybe somebody who needs a painting done in their house, a woman who needs oil change in her, her car, and you have that mechanical background, somebody, a young person who needs help with a class they're taking, and you can spend a day a week tutoring them. What can you do to reach out hospitably? How can you reach out in love to the neighborhood around you that may not know you? Do you have a ministry of intercessory prayer where you're seeking God for your city or your community. God's mission, my mission. We've been chosen for mission. Let's go and do it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that your mission can be our mission. Thank you for the opportunity to reach out like Abraham in loving compassion to people around us, to see them saved in your kingdom. Help us as we go through the Sabbath school lesson this week, not only to have these truths in our head, but to apply them in our own lives personally. Teach us, Lord, like Abraham, to be hospitable, to have a love for people around us, and to be mighty intercessors for you. And may we see men and women and boys and girls saved in your kingdom because of our efforts. In Christ's name, amen.